Welcome to another sermon from All People Christian Church. It is our hope that this message will encourage, inspire, and challenge you in your walk with God. Okay, great. Here we go, guys. So let me just do this. I'm used to having my clicker in my hand, but I got my friend back there, Kendall, who does this for me. I have been preaching a series entitled, Why? Say, Why? (laughs) Okay, that adds a question mark at the end. That is the question i'm finding now more than ever before that very few people young and old have spent enough time if any time at all bothering to ask that question i don't know if you've noticed this but um when covid started to lift the the restrictions or or the government and others started to lift the restrictions i should say from covid people went back to being busy with a vengeance and uh, i see people busier than ever and all of a sudden now nobody's got time to go to church so during covid it was like well there's nowhere to go in person now you can go in person well now i'm too busy i'm like which one is it and the thing i've noticed is that the single greatest stumbling block to people being involved in a church or a campus ministry or both is they are too busy but they haven't bothered asking the question, why? Why am I doing 18 million different things? Do I need to be doing everything I'm doing? Have I even asked myself? And more importantly, have I asked God why and should I be doing this? Amen? So here's the one I want to answer today, part three, as we wrap this up. Why All People Christian Church? Hey, that's a good question. It's fair. We're here for our six-year anniversary, and many people have asked me the question along the way, especially when my wife and I were moving here with our family to get started. People are like, well, don't we already have a lot of good churches in Reno? And the answer is yes, we do have some amazing churches here in Reno. Why are you going to the campus? Don't we already have some campus Christian clubs there? The answer is yes. And guess how much combined all of us are reaching? It's around 3% of the population or less than that on campus. So that right there should answer the question, why? We need a thousand, not 10 more. We need a thousand more church plants. But, say but, okay, under this condition, we're not competing for the same people. You know, one of the ways that we mark Uh, whether or not we're quote succeeding as a church is not by the most standard numbers that people count which is just attendance although it's exciting to see the room filling up and it's your job to help me fill up the rest of these 80 chairs we have here which is very exciting there was no way we could fit 80 chairs in here before unless we stacked on top of each other and uh, it's not only the attendance we need to count it's not only the offering amount that we need to count which is of course important because churches are no different than a a family-owned business or something like that they have to have inflow and income to operate and god decided that he wanted to use his people to provide that he could have just sent the money from heaven but he said no i want my people to give now those are important numbers to count every church counts them but one of the ones we count is what percentage of the people who are coming to our church were either not walking with God at all when we got here, or they were maybe, you know, like the fishers, you know, they knew the Lord, but they were kind of homeless in a way, spiritually speaking. Because that is who God has primarily called us to reach in this city. And we're proud to say it's always close to two-thirds of our church at any given time that fit in those categories. Now, of the other third, like, Some of the best leaders in our church were strategic transfers that came from another church. But for one reason or another, God moved these chess pieces on the board. We actually have sent, I think, I think we've had 250 regular attenders on top of the 60 or so we have now. So think about that. Five times what we have in this room is what we've had in our church at one point or another who have moved or in many cases, gone to the big churches in town. I'm like, man, we're a feeder church, you know? We're the feeder church for the big churches, 
you know, as if they need more people, you know, just there, but it happens. So for one reason or another, God will do that. But our goal is not to just be a better marketing machine or have a better website than the church down the street so that they become disillusioned with their church and then migrate down to ours and then we call that success. That's not the definition of success on God's terms. Amen? Instead, he is counting different numbers than we often count. So let's go here, though. Here's what I want to talk about because those of you who've been coming for a while hear me say this at least once every week. And that is this, that as a church, we cannot be good at everything. There are places that have better audio visual as hard as our team works and as much money as we spend. There are places that have bigger, larger bands with professional full-time musicians in them. There are places that have, it's hard to imagine, better speakers. Uh, I, I doubt that, but, you know, theoretically that could be the case. There are places that have far bigger and better facilities and all these different things. We're not trying to be amazing. We're trying to be the best at all those things I just mentioned that we can be. But at the end of the day, there are two things that we are absolutely doggedly determined to being the best we can possibly be at. And that is providing an atmosphere where people can walk in, grow in, and experience, as Angelica was talking about, authentic relationships and community with imperfect people who are following God as well. And the second one is a place where unless you don't want it, you have every chance you have, you can imagine, to experience spiritual growth. Amen? Those are the two things we're offering, and that is what <clears throat> God has called us to offer. So look at this. Where do we get things like that from? Well, Jesus right here in Matthew 22 gives this famous passage where he was in the middle of this big, long debate with all the teachers of religious law. And they were trying to trick him and trap him. So they tried one more time, mistakenly, to trap Jesus. And here's what happened, guys. <clears throat> it says, one of them, an expert in religious law, tried to trap him with this question. Teacher, which is the most important commandment in the law of Moses? Because they're thinking, I'll nail him. He's going to pick one and we'll all disagree with it. So Jesus replies from Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 5, and he says, simple, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind, with everything you have. But here's where he flips the script on him. He goes, you know what, though? You asked for the greatest. I can't narrow it down to just one because there's really two. There's two. And he goes... This is the first and greatest commandment, but a second is equally, say equally, equally important. Love your neighbor as yourself. He takes that out of Leviticus where they were talking about the social commandments and laws of God and how we're to operate together. He says, check this out, the entire, say the entire. Yeah, that means the whole Law of Moses, all of the Old Testament, not just the law, not just those first five books of the Bible, but all the prophets, everything they had leading up to that. He said, everything the prophets have said on behalf of God you should do or should be, everything the law has taught us, all of it are based on these two commandments. See, here's the genius of God. He doesn't make it complicated to follow it. It's just not easy. You understand? It's simple, but it's not easy. Do you understand the difference? So we often think, you know, like a guy who once asked me, a football player up at UNR, he had given his life to Jesus, so he's just a brand new, newborn Christian. And he goes, so, so Pastor, what, uh, like, what am I allowed to do now and not do? You know, I mean, how many beers can I drink? How, many, you know, can, how do I act with my girlfriend? Whatever. And I said, don't sin and live righteously. That's it. You know, it's like it really just comes down to that. Or love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbors yourself. Everything else is details. Jesus took the entire Old Testament and summed it up in two commandments. Isn't that amazing? So check this out. Why am I talking about this? I keep grabbing for my clicker. That's the timer. 
So uh, maybe I'll start the timer now. Yeah, let's start the whole sermon over. Okay, yeah, we only got two hours left. So here we go, guys. The truth is this. There are two fundamental needs, though, that I continue to find. I've been doing ministry now for over 30 years. I'm in my mid-50s. I've been on the earth for a while, and I found this out. There are two fundamental needs that all people in the world have. You want to know what they are? One is this, to be in relationship with God. Now, the vast majority of the world doesn't realize they need this, but it is why every person, all people, say all people, and then, there you go. See, those who've been coming for a while are all conditioned and trained. So uh, to always follow it up with that. But all people in the world are searching for spiritual answers. The Bible even says eternity is in the heart of all of mankind. So you can go to unreached uh, people groups who have had zero exposure, never come in contact with anyone from what we would call the outside world, and they will have a religious belief system in place. Why is that? Because every person is searching spiritually. Now, the second need is this. Oh, is it popping out on us today? It's okay if it is because I got my notes here. So the second need is this, to be in a relationship with others. This is why in any form of torture or imprisonment, one of the greatest ways to accomplish it is to isolate people, to put them in solitary confinement. Because human beings were meant to be in relationship with each other. That's why none of us enjoyed COVID in all its protocols. Amen? Now, there's a few, you know, people out there who are like, oh, it was great, you know, and I loved it, you know. And, I mean, of course, you know, less stuff on your schedule, that part's nice. But at the end of the day, there is something in you that is craving to be around other people, even though other people are often the source of, of stress and anxiety in your lives. But we are called by God to be in relationship. So it all boils down to, if you want to say it this way, relationship, put the next line up here. It all boils down to that with God and others. The entire Bible, the entire Bible boils down to relationship with God and with others. This is why Christianity is not just another great world religion. Because every other religion on planet Earth, every other cult, every other sect, every other belief system in the world has something that you're supposed to do in order to achieve what we would call salvation or their version of it. Maybe it's the five pillars of Islam. Maybe it's to reach nirvana, you know, in Hinduism. Maybe it's uh, to reach enlightenment in Buddhism. Whatever it may be, there's always a goal to follow the law in Judaism, etc. But Christianity is the only belief system in the world that is telling you this whole thing is about relationship. God created you and wants to have a relationship with you, so he made a way for that to happen by sending his only son. He wants to bring you back to himself, put you in relationship with him, and then teach you, teach you how to be in better and proper relationship with others. That's pretty cool. Look at verse 40. What did Jesus say? He said the entire law and all, say all, all the demands of the prophets are simply based on, on those two relational commandments. So, put the last line up here. You asked the question earlier, all of you were asking, why bother with all people church? Why would you sacrifice so much? Why would you give your own money? Why would you keep raising money, pastor, for your own salary all these years while you're then working all these hours to plant a church and a campus outreach? Why would you at 50-something years of age be out on campus doing Bible study with 18-year-old freshmen who blow you off for an appointment after you drove halfway across town, used up all your gas, and went through that spaghetti loop on the freeway just to get there in time? Why would you do that? Because every human being, all people need a relationship with God in a relationship with others, and we are the best hope they have. Amen? This place needs to be packed to where it's out the door, surrounding Meadowood Mall, and the theaters and the mall and everything else have to shut down while church is going on when we are doing our job helping people to see their need for relationship. Amen? 
So let's break this down for a few minutes and then I'll send you guys on your way today. Here's the deal. We're going to fulfill these two great commandments as we do several things. So if you're taking notes, write these three things down. Number one, I already talked about it. Building authentic relationships. This is what blows me away. Let's look at this next verse here in verse 39. It says this. This was the second one. He said, a second command is equally important. And he goes into Leviticus where they had all these teachings on on how you should relate to each other, on, on hygiene, on diet, and on all kinds of social things. Did you know that the bulk of our legal system was, was really derived from people like John Locke and others who centuries ago, even if they weren't religious, looked to the Bible to build a fair and just legal system? Did you know things like innocent until proven guilty, a jury by your peers, uh, all of these different things that are absolutely essential to our freedom and that we take for granted, they all come from God's Word, from places like the book of Leviticus. So he said this, he said, love your neighbor as yourself. What does that mean? Well, look with me here. I wrote a couple things down. Two things it's going to require more than anything. The two things we have the hardest time giving. Love and time. Amen? Love, because look at this next one. Love means you can't cancel. Oh, and we love to cancel, don't we? Boy, cancel culture's on fire. Because, see, if I don't like you, I don't like what you're saying, I don't like your politics, I don't like your skin color... I don't like something you said to me a week ago. I just make it easy. I just cancel you. I just get rid of you. And then I don't have to deal with you. And I'm a whole lot more lonely, too, in the process. Because I just keep canceling everybody until I realize that people also want to cancel me. And then it just never ends. Somebody was asking me when I preached on it a couple months ago about turning the other cheek, what Jesus meant by that. And I said, you know, if you wanted to put it in modern terms, he meant you can't cancel. He meant that maybe I lend somebody my car and then they, for the third time, take it out and don't fill it up with any gas and bring it back all beat up and dirty. Or maybe this time they wreck it. I'm going to be like, you know what? I'm not lending them my car anymore. But I'm not going to cancel them as a friend. Do you see the difference? Turning the other cheek doesn't mean you're an idiot who forgets everything and you're just a sucker for self-abuse. It means that you are not going to just write people off every chance you get. Amen? You're going to give them a second chance. Here's the other one about time. The reason that is so darn hard to give is because it requires priority and sacrifice. You know, I'm privileged to have some of my family here today and... Um, as I can tell you, as a father, having raised four kids who are all now adults, that uh, one of the biggest things I had to give up as a dad, that I kind of have a little bit of it back to myself, although, you know, once you're family, you're always family, so you're always responsible for your kids, at least in your own heart you are, you know, until the day they pass on or you do, and that's this, is I gave up my time. I mean, my golf game went down the tubes after I started having kids. I mean, my free time was goners because, you know, there were so many activities and dance recitals and sporting events and homeschool or, 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 or more income you had to make to pay for more doctor bills or whatever. That's just what you do when you're a parent. Now, I, I've done it all these years as a minister, too. I have given up all of my personal time so many different times for somebody else. My son last night even had a player that reached out to him and was like, I need to talk to you now. It can't wait. And I was like, man, I get this, bro. I get this. This is what it means to be a coach. You know, is you, you have to just give up your time. My daughter's a teacher now, and she's like at my son's game having to grade papers in the stands, you know, because these are due and these kids need the help. And it's just what you do. But priority and sacrifice is the hardest thing for us to give and to make. 
and yet it's what it takes for relationship. So I am preaching against this trend in the church nowadays where, hey, uh, COVID was great and I can just watch church online and, um, you know, I don't really need to know anybody in that church. And the guy's message, he always has a good joke or two and I feel the tinglys after and that usually gives me enough for the week and all that stuff and I'm like, that ain't Christianity. That's just having a spoonful of good spiritual food. But that's not Christianity. Amen? Let's go on to the next one. We're going to also, number two, need to do this. Experience spiritual growth. You see, the reason local churches exist is because one of my great uh, heroes of the faith once said, the local church is the hope of the world. Why? Because the local church is where you live your Christianity out. If you can't learn to love your neighbors yourself and you only want to love the Lord your God because he doesn't offend you and because he's perfect and because he won't cancel you no matter how ridiculously you act, well, you're only fulfilling half the gospel. The local church is what gives you a chance to do more. Let's go here to verse 38. It said, this is the first Say the first and greatest. Say and greatest. This is the first and greatest commandment. To love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Why am I saying that in the context of spiritual growth? Because the more you love God, the more you will grow spiritually. Here's another trend that I'm preaching against that has happened, especially in American church culture, and that is this. That somehow, as if we're a bunch of... uh, like new age believers there's some kind of like ability to have spiritual growth without obedience and relationship with God like you just read your Bible or listen to the verse of the day or something as some kind of like a multivitamin you take spiritually that's not what it is it's all about what Jesus lived out which was always trying to be closer to God his father amen let's go to some of what I put up here it says this I'm going to take my notes with me too. This also requires love and time. And here's what I mean by that. Put up what I mean by love. When it comes to loving God, I'll tell you how you love him. You need to love God by having a handle on what his love languages are. Has anybody ever heard of or done the book about love languages? You ever heard that? You know, it's like when a friend of yours or someone that you're dating or whatever it may be uh, says that, hey, thoughtful gift giving that's my love language but then instead you're always trying to give them more uh, verbal affection and they're like I appreciate that but you never buy me flowers unless it's my birthday or whatever and you're missing it right you're trying to give them an x and they want a y well if you want to love God here's how you do it read the bible and you'll see this in there he loves obedience just like any good father does Like, you love me, just quit fighting with me and just trust me and do what I say. And that's the next one, trust. When we trust God, when we don't try to tell him how our life should be lived, but we ask him instead and then do it obediently the way he wants us to, we are communicating love to him. Amen? Go to the next one here. Here's what I mean by time, priority and sacrifice. You know, it blows me away how often Christians will say, I just don't have time to read my Bible. So it's like this. So you're wanting to know the answers to everything in life. God has gone out of his way to give you all the answers. Then you're saying you want to know God, and he has written you a personal letter, an autobiography of himself in great detail, and you don't have time to read it. But you have time to binge watch, you know, TikTok for three straight hours watching the most nonsensical video clips in the history of the world. But you don't have 15 minutes to read the one and only holy and living word of God. That doesn't make any sense. You know, the other greatest commandment that is disobeyed as a lifestyle now is one of the Ten Commandments, honor the Sabbath. You know what honor the Sabbath was? It wasn't meant to lock you down into COVID once a week. It was meant to say, why don't you stop working seven days a week as if you are in charge of providing for your life? 
why don't you quit sleeping two hours a night and killing yourself with work and then complaining about how tired and stressed out you are? Why don't you take the gift? Jesus said the Sabbath was made for man, for us, not for God. He said, I am giving you permission. Say permission. He said, I give you permission to take at least one day a week off to rest. I'm like, thank you, God. I probably wouldn't do it if he didn't. One day a week, and the only other thing he asks is, when you rest, it's a chance to reflect on me. But now, on a Sunday morning, which would be the Sabbath for most people, a chance to worship and go home and nap or rest or do whatever, people are working. People are running around doing 18,000 different activities. Drives me crazy how every youth sport known to man in America now plans peewee cheerleading practice and soccer practice for six-year-olds on Sunday. These kids are not going to be professional cheerleaders or soccer players. And then I have parents who think that the way to love your child is to sign them up for every event ever created and then to be there for those. And I asked a parent once, I finally said, look, you mean to tell me that it's more important to your child's future that you get them involved in three different sports at one time than it is to take them to church? The answer is no way. So let's go to the last part here. Number three as I close. We will fulfill these two great commandments as we belong versus attend. We have an epidemic in our society of people attending and not belonging. You know, as I was going around, driving around to some of the fancier, bigger churches in town to get ideas for, like, ceiling lights and flooring and stuff like that, I'm going to be honest, I was dripping with envy. I was like, look at these facilities. Look at all this money they have. Look at all this, and one of them's like, yeah, we're outgrowing it, you know, I got to go to three services, and I'm like, well, who goes to these churches? I haven't met them. Then I start finding out that some of the worst people in your neighborhood are doing that. And I'm thinking, no, 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 this is not what it is, people. It is not about just getting a huge crowd. Now, I want to fill this room and beyond, but not just with bodies, not just with people I paid to come to church to fill the seats. I want to see what God is counting, and that is changed lives. How many lives has your church changed? How many lives have you changed in the course of your lifetime? Not how many degrees do you hold, how much money have you made, and how many jobs can you keep at one time? That's not what God is counting. It's changed lives. We need to belong versus attend. The vast, vast majority of Christians in the world today simply attend somewhere. They attend someone else, whether it's committed volunteers, it's usually 20% or less, or paid staff do all the work. You show up, you put a little bit of money in the, in the bucket because you feel obligated to, you know, somebody's got to pay the bills. And, uh, and then you come late, you leave early. And you may or may not even talk to anybody the whole time you're there. That's not belonging. That's attending. I attend my local Starbucks. I don't feel, I feel actually more obligated to them and their well-being than I do, than many Christians do their church. You know, because I'm kind of like, oh, this place is going downhill, you know. I, I probably should tip this poor girl. She's working on minimum wage or whatever, you know. I feel this sense of responsibility. But I don't feel like I can't just change my Starbucks anytime I want. Because I don't belong there, I attend there. Does that make sense? But that's about the level of commitment people often have for their local church. No, a local church is a family, amen? Look at this next thing I put up here. It's this. Jesus said the entire law and all the demands of the prophets are based on these two relational commandments that have nothing to do with attending and everything to do with time, sacrifice, love, and priority. Go to the next line here. It says this. We cannot fulfill God's plan for our life without spiritual family. I can't tell you how many Christians I've met along the way throughout my journey 
who have never truly belonged to a church. They've just bounced from place to place to place. And every time they leave, they always have a list of criticisms for the church. It's never, ever their fault. It's always the fault of the people and the church, right? And as soon as they come through our doors, I'm like, oh, no. I can see where this is going already. And I can't think of one where it's ever worked out because they just keep repeating the pattern. They don't want to listen. They don't want whatever. You know what happens in family? People get in your face. People confront you with things you don't want to know. They'll say, you know, I love you, but you can really be selfish sometimes. Or gosh, I love you, but you, you never remember my birthday. <laughs> you know, or I love you, but you talk the whole time. I'd like to get a word in edgewise, you know. But you know, you can't talk like that to anybody unless you have a relationship with them. And you can't have a relationship with them unless you spend time with them. And I don't mean just a quick, you know, two-second wave in the parking lot. And you can't spend time with them if you're not committed to them and they're not a priority and you don't value and love them like you do a spiritual family. A spiritual family is a family of imperfect people who are involved in each other's business at some level, which is an anath uh, what's that word, anathema or something like that. It's just unthinkable to any of us today to have people involved in our business. So we just want to be unaccountable and independent, amen? But a family wants to get in there. So let's go to the summary here as I close. Oh, I'm sorry, I forgot. I had 1 Corinthians 12 up here to help make the point. Let me just end with this scripture and I'll do the summary. But our bodies have many parts, Paul said in 1 Corinthians 12. And God has put each part just where he wants it. How strange would a body be if it had nothing but a hand or an arm? Yes, there are many parts, but only one body. So how could a Christian ever say, I am uh, in a relationship with God, I just don't do church. I just don't do Christians. That's like saying I'm in the body, but I operate independently. If your hand did whatever it wanted, whenever it wanted, that would be weird and you would go to the doctor to get it fixed, right? Yes, but there's a lot of hands out there that are like, I do whatever I want, and then we're trying to operate, and we're like this. You know, it's just not working. Amen? So now go to the summary, please. Thank you. All people, say all people, yes, yes, right, yep, there you go. They all need a relationship with God and a relationship with each other, and that is why God planted this church, amen, six years ago, and why we need to be here in 60 years, amen. I'm going to pray with you and then bring Jory up. Thank you, AJ. Father, I thank you so much for this beautiful group of people. I thank you I could even celebrate today with my own family. And um, God, I thank you that I have two families in this life. I have my beautiful wife and my mom and my dad and my children and others who I'm related to legally and biologically and they are my family for life I would do anything for them and God I have a second family that's no less important God in so many ways it's like my friend the other day Lord who I saw in Arizona who was in my wedding party and we've been friends for over 30 years we only get to talk a few times a year and it's like we've never skipped a beat and he said we are in a fraternity for eternity and I said, amen. I thank you, God, that you don't give us one family, you give us two. And I pray that everybody within the sound of my voice, Lord, would recognize that one of the greatest blessings you've ever wanted to give them was to be part of a local church. So help each of us to own that vision, to take responsibility for that vision, to serve, to attend, to give, to do those things, but then also, God, to enjoy it. In your mighty name, Jesus, amen. And amen. Praise God. Come on up here, baby. We hope you enjoyed this message from All People Christian Church. For more information about our church or for more sermons like these, please check us out on the web at allpeoplecc.com.